All right, I'm here with Michael for our now pretty much at least semi-weekly catch-ups since uh, uh, Michael is uh, schedule doesn't work with the normal Grail Country conversations and we still want uh, Michael to be able to be uh, participate in, in the channel. So we've been doing these kind of weekly catch-ups and we've been talking about sometimes some of the conversations that we've been having um, as a group and then sometimes we talk about just like whatever thing today we decided that we have both been working our way through david bentley hart's new book you are gods on nature and supernature and in our, in one of our previous conversations we actually talked about chapter two of that book which focused on um the thought of nicholas of Cusa. Um, and today we are going to actually do a dive into the final essay of this book, which is called The Chiasmus, The Created Supernatural and the Divine Natural. Um, and we both agree that there's just so much in this that we're just going to, and the way, the way Hart does it is he actually lays out a series of, of 30 some, I think it's 35 what is it? 36 of 36 bullet points where he kind of outlines essentially his entire theological vision, like in this <laughs> one essay. So um, it's like a really, it's like a condensed, it kind of could be a condensed introduction to the thought of David Bentley Hart for someone if they wanted to, to check out this essay because it's so, it covers so much ground. So we decided to just go point by point and we'll see how far we get. This is probably going to end up being more than one part um would be my instinct unless we are just able to be more, more far more efficient than i imagine um and then we decided the way we will break it down is that um, i would take the odd numbered uh bullet points and or the odd numbered items and michael would take the even so i'm just going to dive right in to number bullet point number one of chapter six uh the chiasmus the created supernatural and divine and, and natural divine by david bentley hart and it enter, it it, uh, it opens with a uh, quote from meister eckhart which is in german which i will not butcher um <laughs> so i'll just dive into the actual the actual text one granting the legitimacy and necessity of all the traditional apophatic restrictions placed upon our language regarding god we should still not hesitate to affirm that the, ir the irrepressible tra transcendental desire of any rational nature is to ascend from the indigence of mere phenomenal experience to the boundless richness of a perfect and immediate knowledge of the wellspring of all being. Whatever the limits of our desires and ambitions of psychological selves or empirical egos, egos may or ought to be, all our mental intentions and volitional inclinations are embraced within and could not exist apart from a more primordial, primordial movement of the rational will toward its one infinite source and end. This does not contradict the rule that the finite, in, that finite intellects cannot comprehend the infinite in itself. The apophatic is, in a sense, logically entailed in the very concept of desire for infinite knowledge. What we seek, however, is not a quantitative accumulation of all possible information, what we seek is not a mere knowledge about episteme, but rather an immediate acquaintance, a true knowledge of gnosis. Being in its transcendental fullness, this is obvious. No finite terminus of desire could draw the rational will to itself were it not set off against an encompassing infinite horizon of being and its transcendental perfections. Only thus is anything finite capable of becoming for us an object of recognition, evaluation, and judgment, and so of election, rejection, or indifference. We love the good, the true, and the beautiful as ultimate objects of what Maximus the Confessor calls our natural will. We love anything finite only as an object illumined by, the natural by this natural desire and then submitted to the determinations of the gnomic or deliberative will. And, but for this supernatural illumination, the object would never be visible to the intellect or will as an object of choice, but for a tacit rational grasp of the supernatural as the most original movement of our nature. 
we would be incapable of any explicit rational grasp of the natural. As Nicholas of Cusa says, quod nisi Deus eset infinitus non forut finis desidere, desidere. Were God not infinite, he could not be an end for desire. Or in the words of William Law, thy natural senses cannot possess God or unite thee to him. Nay, thine inward faculties of understanding, will and memory can only reach after God, but cannot be the place of his habitation in thee. But there is a root and depth in thee from whence all these faculties come forth as lines from a center or as branches from the body of the tree. This depth is called the center, the fund or bottom of the soul. This depth is the unity, the eternity. And I had almost said the infinity of thy soul for it is so infinite that nothing can satisfy it or give it any rest, but the infinity of God. So that's yeah, it's a doozy bullet of an point opener. one. And what's interesting about this is he's not really, he's really for the most part in this essay, he's not really making arguments. It's really yeah. a series of assertions, which many of which he has argued for in other places. So yeah, throughout this book, in fact, yeah. It, yeah, right. So he's just kind of, this is just, he's wrapping it up here. So don't expect, if you're expecting to see him argue for why these things are the case, that's not happening in this particular essay. That's not what he's doing. Yeah. Um, th there's, th so th throughout this book, he, he makes a very compelling case, case for this idea that the, the infinite is always already present with the finite. Um, in, 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 in a certain sense, he makes it um, somewhat almost illogical or impossible for those two to be ever separate. Right. It's like a part and, whole relationship. Yeah. And, and I think here he, he does a good job of, of kind of, um, of, of showcasing the fact that the, the ways in which those things um, are, especially the way he ends this passage in talking about um, our, right. our infinite desire with a specific reference um, to Nicholas of Cusa, who, who um, in, I think it's chapter two of this book, that was the earlier thing we talked about, um, goes into some, some detail on, on this, this, um, this necessity for the infinity to, even while, you know, and of course he starts this, this little brief thing by saying, of course, the limitations of language um, means that there is this apophatic uh, element to everything we're doing and yet we all have a sort of phenomenological experience of the infinite as a guiding principle for all that we want and desire and evaluate consider etc yeah and he comes around to this later on well he mentioned this there are actually several times in this particular book where he mentions it where how much of this really like hangs on well how Genesis 2 7 actually illustrates the truth of a lot of this. I wouldn't, so it's more that Genesis 2 7 illustrates the truth of this. I was going to say that, like, so much of it hangs on Genesis 2 7, but mm -hmm. I just think just Genesis 2 7 really points us in this direction because, like, it's God's breath that is breathed into the nostrils of Adam. Yeah. And, and I love, well, it kind of alludes a little bit to because again like this idea of breath and spirit or it's the same word right originally in hebrew right, and, right. and then also in the greek and, and the then greek it, too, yeah. and then the final um the very final passage of this he he makes the assertion that in some sense you can't really tease those things apart that there is in some sense i think he, i think the exact way he puts it is that the, the, the idea of a created spirit is that kind of an oxymoron in a certain sense that all things are are flowing from all spirit flows from the one spirit. Yeah. He also, the other thing is, is like, and, and he really is kind of, I couldn't help but think of um, Esther Meek and John Verveke and um, uh, uh, in this context a little bit, because he's really, he's, he's really, he's really resisting hard, like, the the epistemology of modernity mm -hmm. um be, and he's pushing toward this kind of vision that's well that's also i mean he's pushing toward it because it's part of the classical christian tradition of this like 
of this place where knowing and being are really the same act. Yeah. Well, it's it's top down versus bottom up, which which makes a lot of sense because you, you can't have any whenever I've been thinking about this a lot recently, where any uh, th there's a great um, Catherine Pickstock video that she does uh, that I recommend folks look up. It's called if you just Google her name, Catherine Pitts Pickstock and what is truth, where she goes into some great detail, you know, on um, what is this thing called truth? And, and she kind of starts it by saying, like, is truth just what is the case? Is it just the objective facts? And then she kind of obliterates that over the course of a fairly long, um, you know, very detailed analysis of, of what we mean by truth. But one of the one of the things she gets to very quickly is that surely when we say the word truth, we're not saying we're not saying just what is the case. We're, we're referring to something that has this sort of eternal momentous quality. And it doesn't matter who you are when, when you use that word, the truth, like when you use it in an argument or conversation, you're appealing to something that is above <laughs> whatever the facts are, right? It is right. something that, that sits above and gives clarity and depth and meaning to those facts. And, and so for, and, and, and it, it doesn't sit at the same level with them at all. And so um, I, I, what's interesting here is that he's, he's starting from this presumption that the above exists and, and I think in some sense, it, 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 it is a fundamental appeal to our phenomenological experience of the world that we are, we do experience these layers, that there are things that are more or better, more, more true, right. more good, would, more, et cetera. Right. This would be, I've been, well, this is what, this is really what was traditionally meant by intuition was these, was these kind of like in, in intellectual intuition of things that are just kind of known to the soul that don't really need demonstration mm -hmm. right um that modernity went about systematically and dubiously calling into question yeah it calls them into question but then then because our language is so ancient it doesn't realize that it's still making appeals to those depths all the time. Right. 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 Which yes. Yeah. We, right. Which I, I, yes, it's almost exists entirely at the layer of language because it doesn't, because it can only, because when you're not operating with those kind of fundamental, like intellectual intuitions, then the only thing you can do is play a language game. Mm hmm because you you can't make it you can't make it match reality right so it just becomes like an in, you know an endless succession of like warring paradigms that are just really nice linguistic constructions but merely linguistic constructions right that never really cohere with reality as we phenomenologically experience it so absolutely um so you want to take number two yeah 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 i think it's great Great point to, blow, blow, to come into that. So part two, or number two, we know the transcendent end that calls to us before and after any concepts we may employ to capture it as something answerable to our gaze and to our will. We know the supernatural first and the natural only in, the, in consequence thereof. Our first quote unquote empirical or effective experience of this transcendental vocation comes as that preconceptual wonder at the sheer givenness of being, the sheer inexplicability of existence that seizes us even in childhood, and that fitfully takes hold of us again and again throughout life in those rare moments when we make an unanticipated and transitory surrender to the mystery of being's event. In such moments we experience, in addition to even the commonest object of attention, the mysterious fortuity of its existence, the infinitely irreducible interval of the surfeit of being with a capital B over beings. But we also there, thereby discover an intentional range within ourselves capable of that interval. And so capable of going beyond the finite occasion of experience toward the inexhaustible source of its event, the whole actuality of being. 
As we age, of course, we attempt to banish that wonder from our minds and to master the mystery of being incomprehensible ideas or projects. But in its first apprehension, it is an experience of an intimacy with being's mystery as yet uninterrupted by concepts of the mind or purposes of the will. And what we crave in the deepest reaches of our nature is at once a return to and an advance toward a still higher intimacy with that mystery. One in which, again, those concepts and purposes can no longer separate us from what calls to us. Now, not because they have yet to be formulated, but because they have been exhausted. We seek a wise innocence that knows directly. In the deepest reaches of our thoughts and desires, we seek to become transparent in mind and will to the logos of all things. So yeah, that's participation. Like that's, yeah. uh, I mean, that's, that's what it is. And, 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 and everyone has, every, it, it is a universal possession of all persons. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's how, how resistant are we to accept this is exactly what I, and, and that participation is exactly what I was referring to previously when we're talking about point one is that the sort of like base level intellectual intuitions. Yeah. Well, it's, like, what's interesting is the, the, how we have come up with, as he, as he uses the term here, concepts, formulas, et cetera, that specifically bracket out that what you were just referring to as participation as being part of the real, that that's, that's illusory. It's, it's a sort of, right. um, you know, a weird chemical soup of interactions in the brain. That's completely random um, has, you know, some, some sort of uh, tenuous link to reality. Even though is, what he's describing is that that fundamental like intuition that he is describing is actually the thing that we call real mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean oh, yeah. right so that's like well out, that's out, why out, that, outside that's why people of when they have philosophical pe debate people yes. when they have mystical experiences that's why they say it was more real than real or or, it, or, or any, you know. any decisive turning point in their own personal story and when right. they, when they were, were were trying to kind of uh search out the depths of their own soul or the um the the, the infinite number of facts they had in terms of making a, a, a crucial decision for their own life. And, and whenever they use that term real, they're, they're saying that there's some, yeah, phenomenal logical experience that seizes upon them that is present and direct and transcends right. um, all those, all those um, kind of lower level objects and facts. Right. And this is also like, like the experience of like really deeply knowing something is like that too. Like that's, like knowing facts about something ultimately isn't really knowing it, mm -hmm. not in this way, but the things that you really deeply know, this is, this is actually the way in which you know them. Yeah. Through that sense of wonder or intellectual intuition or whatever, whatever participation, whatever la label you want to use it. That's like, that is the thing which leads you into the deepest possible knowing. And, and one of the interesting things about this particular way of knowing is that it, it, it explicitly calls to an awareness of the depths that are hidden from sight. So you, there, right. there's this sort of contact with the thing, but it also intimates uh, depths that are um, at, at the moment um, unavailable to you but 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 it, but sort of invites you into an exploration of them right yeah right exactly exactly and it's inexhaustible you know there's always more of it to be disclosed that's one of the things that makes it so worthwhile so yeah absolutely yeah, okay so i guess i'll take uh i'll take i'll take number three since that was our arrangement. Okay, let's see here. Number three, to say this otherwise, it is an axiom of philosophy 
one that requires no particular metaphysical commitments, that the ordo cognoscendi is the inversion of the ordo ascendi, and that the terminus ad quim of each is the terminus a quo of the other. This is can you, can you explain those terms? That was that was kind of throwing me for a loop. All the Latin terms there. I assume they are specific. Well, yeah, that's like so. That's like he's talking. Cognoscendi has to deal deal with like with like knowing, and ascendi has to do with like essences. Okay. Right? Um, and the uh, um, the terminus ad quem and the terminus ad quo. Actually, let me actually get. But honestly, that's I will have to look that up. Hold yeah, so it's talking about the end of something, but I don't really understand the diff distinction between ad quem versus ad quo. So ad quem is a goal or a finishing point or a limiting point in time. And ad quo is a starting point or origin. So it's the difference between like the beginning and end of a thing. So let me go back and read that again then. Let's see. To say this otherwise, it isn't to say this otherwise, it is an axiom of philosophy, one that requires no particular metaphysical commitments, that the ordo cognoscendi is the inversion of the ordo of the ordo ascendi, and that the terminus ad quem of each is the terminus a quo of the other. This is obvious from the most minimal conditions of experience. In temporal terms, all causes and their effects are simultaneous. As ancient and medieval tradition asserts, even in, in the cases of causes that arrive from the past or future. In the order of Cindy, however, all causes are logically prior to their effects. And in the order cognoscendi, just the reverse is true. All causes are posterior discoveries. Preceded by a sheer event that is a phenomenal experience before, it is an intelligible truth. The event comes first for us. While its causes lie only in the end of the wakened intellect's journey toward a reality that the event has already made manifest, but not yet rendered wholly intelligible. Usually this axiom is taken merely as an epistemological rule that for us causes are known only through their effects. It should, however, be taken no less on an as an ontological law. Being is of necessity disclosure repleting itself only insofar it is known to intentional mind, for all true knowledge must be then nothing less than a direct participation in being's most essential actuality, which is kind of what we were just, <laughs> just saying a moment ago. So we were kind of anticipating, well, perhaps because we'd already read the entire thing, we were kind of anticipating where he was going. The inverse proportion of these two ordinaries, uh, of these two ordinaries, excuse me, these two ordains are in fact simply two ways of looking at an inseparable and complementary in terms of the single indivisible event of being and knowing. So, which would be like, that's the, that's, that is what participation is, which is why I think, was, I think like John has been like, John has been pretty upfront about the fact that like when he's talking about participating knowing he's kind of like he realizes that he's kind of he's towing across the ontological and epistemological barrier he's like been very upfront about that yeah um well what's interesting too and I don't and I think he goes into this later but like this idea between this connection between being and intelligibility right that in, in some sense, to exist is to be known. Um, and and there's there's kind of whispers of this, I think, in um, some of the the language around the the kind of the age to come, where where um, where Paul like talks about then we will be known as we right. know, like like this. There, there's this, this some yeah, and this is also why I really wanted. Uh, him and John to talk so so badly because um, I think like 
John seems to also have a sense that like reality needs to have an intelligibility to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this is why I thought there was, there would actually be like grounds for a really fruitful conversation. Should that, should that, should that have happened? So who knows, maybe, maybe at some point the tide will turn and that, that might happen in the future. Um, but yeah, and this is also like, this is essentially like Esther, Esther Meek, who's following Kalani, like this is essentially what she's doing with her epistemology too. Although for her, she's actually, and I think, well, David, as you'll David would be the same too, where um, it, it, it's a, it's a call. It's not only um, where a meeting of being and knowing, but also ultimately knowing is revealed to be loving. Mm -hmm. So well, it's interesting, too, is that this idea, so he says here, the, the inseparable and complementary terms of the single indivisible event of being and knowing. Um, and I think, you know, right there, he's kind of referring to our experience of those realities, but but at other junctures in the um, in the same essay, he makes that same comparison to God's being, right? So it's, right. there's a sense in which um, the infinite, even though it is infinite, does not escape this necessity of the intelligibility that is attached to it so it's not to say like uh, even, even though the we can't in some sense comprehend the infinite it's still always in, in some sense there is this knowledge that always exists of, of god himself knowing himself and, and and he gets in later into some of the ways in which the trinity is kind of right. crucial to quote unquote being with a capital well, I would say that's the knowledge that's like that's that's that that knowledge, the knowing as God knows is the knowing that is not that is not the knowing of 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 good it's not that is not the knowing of of good and evil. Mm -hmm. Like it's so like that right. Cause he talks about the he talks us, about also that there isn't this sense of possibility within it. It's a, a sort of it's it's a it's a freedom that we do not know um because of our our constricted and and um finite nature yeah um, for 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 david in this essay the way he's he he essentially frames it as like essentially the residual effects of our being called out of non-being so um but that the the end toward which we're moving is the is that where that division does not exist right and, and our being and knowing are a single unified act as it is in god yeah do you want to keep moving on yeah, to four let's, keep, let's okay. keep moving yeah so four starts a new kind of subdivision <clears throat> which is part two knowledge and being as the chiasmus uh, four we are accustomed here in modernity's evenings, evening twilight, to conceive of our knowledge of the world principally as a regime of representation, according to which sensory intuitions are transformed into symbolic images by some kind of neurological and perceptual metabolism, and then subjected to whatever formal conceptual determinations our transcendental apperception and apparatus of perception might permit. The act of knowing, in this scheme is not situated immediately within being's own movement of disclosure. Conversely, that movement is not immediately situated within the mind's most proper act. Knowledge then consists in no more than a kind of cognitive allegory of and logical du deduction about being, because being in itself possesses an occult adversity or resistance to being known. All that we experience in experiencing the world then is an obscure, logically inexplicable, but unremitting correspondence between mind and world. One whose ontological basis is not a presumed primordial identity between them, but rather something like a pre-established harmony or purely fortuitous synchrony or inexplicable coherent illusion. 
I think I'll just interrupt real quickly to say like what he's talking about. This this drew me for a loop the first time. It's such a long, but he's he's saying he's laying out the uh, the the ontology of modernity, not not the one that he's right in arguing for in this. He's he's setting this up as a foil to his conceptions. Um, the more rational assumption, however, is that so implausible a liaison between absolutely incommensurable spheres of reality is impossible. And that in fact, mind and world must belong to one another from the first as flowing from and continuously participating in a single source that is at once ontological. And I think this is nociological, mm -hmm. ontological and nociological in, and in which the ontological and the nociological are one and the same. So, yeah. What is the nociological? That's I know it's it looks like it's something. No, gnosis. Nociological is yeah, it's related to gnosis. So, um, and and which would if you relate back, he um, what was it back in section one? He 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 uh, he establishes gnosis as being related is knowledge of as opposed to episteme being knowledge about, right? Right. So that's not, so that's that's how we, that's how we know um, the kind of like that, that continuity of, of being and knowing that he's talking about. Mm -hmm. I, so I that, find it which which means that he's relating it to experience mm -hmm. because that's how you have knowledge of things experience as opposed to what he's describing here earlier is you know the these conceptions um, right formal conceptual, conceptual determinations. determinations right exactly Yeah, so it's a it, that kind of gnosis is a more it's it's a it's a more direct knowledge. It's you know, you know the thing directly because you have knowledge of it because you have direct experience of it. Yeah, I like I like what he he describes. Uh, modernity's version of knowledge is ultimately like it it, it kind of boils down to this inexplicably coherent illusion. It's powerful, and and it, it's a, it's powerful, and um, yeah, um, it's very powerful. Yeah. What do you think of what? What do you think about that? About what? What do you think makes it such a coherent illusion? Why is it? Why? Why does it hold such power? Well. <sighs> I thought about this recently where it's almost like in the modern frame, what we've done is we, we stumbled upon like sort of Alice in Wonderland, like we stumbled upon some little food that said, eat me. We ate it and we got a lot smaller. And at this smaller frame, we suddenly saw that there was all these patterns and things in the world we didn't have access to at that, at our larger frame. And so we said, oh, wow, this must be this. I thought X was being caused by, by these things. And now I find down here, there's a substructure that gives me some insight into, you know, quote, a more, quote, more fundamental things. And we've kind of just done this in a series where we, we, we stumble along something else and we say, uh, you know, eat me and it, it, we get smaller and even still. And we, so we've been going sort of down the ladder of, to try and find more tinier and tinier sort of fragments of reality. And, each time we do that, we think we've stumbled across something that's more fundamental. But in this, so it's it's a it's a it's a it's a cognitive approach that focuses on the parts versus the whole, and we become so obsessed with that motion that we can't. We're, we're always looking down and can't look back up to see that there is there is no real rational, coherent, um, explanatory. Um, um, something that that takes into account the whole. We don't have anything like that, 
and and what he describes here is is when he kind of sums it all up here it's it's laughable um when compared with the more what he says the more rational assumption which is to assume that there must be some coherence between mind and reality so in that they came from the same source rather than to say that right. there's this very you know random and tenuous and, and um, inexplicably coherent illusion that we're experiencing. But Mike, I think my, my question was a little bit, yeah, I totally agree with everything you said there. My question was a slightly different question though. I was actually okay. like inviting a speculation as to what, what it is, like, why did we venture into this path in the first place? Like what, like, what this was the being... Yeah like modernity like what what it what, okay. like and and the kind of like you know the epistemology that 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 flows out of it like what was it what was it about to begin with well i think if you look at any of the real turns the the people that made those those radical um contributions to um our scientific knowledge, I, I would say that all of those people passing through those little passages and, and going, you know, doing the whole thing of, of like imaginatively becoming smaller and seeing the world to its length, they were experiencing something that was just like the participation we talked about in part two, where they, they had a, this sort of imaginative opening up of the world. Um, that gave them real insights. And it was, it was a captivating wonder that, that drove further exploration and a sense of, um, uh, of depths to be explored, to, like we were just talking about. And that still and so, is what drives all really great science. Yeah, but I mean, somehow it, we, we- You we, couldn't be, process, a, honestly, if you didn't have, you couldn't be a great scientist without that, that sense of wonder. You really couldn't. Yeah. And, and, and Barfield has some, some, I think it's in Saving the Appearances, where he has some very interesting things to say, where he's, I'm trying to remember if it's that or one of the, one of his essays, where, but he makes the point about it's, it's, it's not the specialist that causes us the problem, it's, it's the specialist that, it's where we, we take these, these, these principles and we try and generalize to the whole, when they're, they're, they're very narrowly focused in this very specific field, and they tell us things that are very useful and pragmatic within that very narrow field, but then we try to take them and generalize them to the whole is where we kind of run into these, right. the problem. Well, see, that's what, what's what, that's what Ganon says. It's not, he says that it's not that tradition didn't under, didn't know about these things. It's just that they didn't have a very high view of them. So, right. They were smaller. They were trivial. They were, they were, they didn't have the time so or that, energy to in survival in a mode to go in and investigate all those things, right. even so though they, for, were, they might be interesting. Right. So for him, the problem is that we've just like elevated these kinds of things, like out of where they belong in the hierarchy of knowing. Yeah. We, well, we've, I would put, say, we've put, we, we've put knowledge of the least consequential things into the, at the top of the hierarchy. And, essentially. And, and now that we've been doing it for such a long time, you can see like in, in a lot of real terms, our science is completely stalled, you know, because we're, we're going into smaller and smaller little avenues and little dead ends. And, um, and we think we're exploring the world, but like, there's this huge, right. vast. That's, what's really funny about it is that, is that idea that we have like, are focusing on the least important things is like literally borne out in like what the science focuses on. It's like, the small smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller bits until like eventually you have to get to that's that's where that's where Hart, that's where where harding is a little bit hopeful here because you know for harding is like eventually you, you have to get down to the point where you're at at the at nothing and then once you're at nothing then you open back up again to the hole mm -hmm. so yeah, here's hoping that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I, but it's not kind of what's happening though. Haven't isn't that's what ha what's happening? I mean, there's a lot of bad things in our culture too, but I still see like that's. I kind of see that too. I see where like oh, a lot of us have got down to the nothing. Yeah, well, I think and really confronted the nothing, at the bottom of it, and that has in fact opened a whole swath of people back up to the whole backed up to a larger vision of reality that is no longer focused on 
the smallest and smallest of parts and has a more mm-hmm. holistic mm-hmm. vision that that you know has more layers of knowledge than and doesn't accept this knowledge of the of the smallest and most and, and lowest layer of reality as to be the most fundamental yeah you know? well i think the further the further you descend down that ladder of of these you know the inconsequential the trivial bits um and especially if you're not one of those people that has had the imaginative participatory mode of of experiencing those those kind of um bits of reality you just you read it in a book from somebody else and you're now told this is the way things are uh and if you're smart right you you you, you, you sign up for it like everybody else like i think has a sort of to, <laughs> to try and elevate those things to be the most important things you have to you, you, you there's doing some sort of there's some sort of cognitive dissonance you're going through and it's, it's been, getting yeah, right. It's like, it's time. like I said, like I said, in our last conversation, I think it was another conversation we had with Luke. I said, you don't know an electron because you yeah. saw, you saw a diagram of an electron. You have no, yeah. you have more, honestly, you have more, and this is not a joke. I mean this deadly seriously. You have more genuine experience of fairies than you do of electrons. I'm not kidding. You, you yeah. really have more of an idea of what a fairy is. You have more experience of the reality of a fairy than you do of an electron. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's really interesting. I, I think it's absolutely true, but it's, it's interesting to think about what the consequences are of that are. Right. Right. But I, I think, yeah, it, uh, what it leads to is a lot of lying to yourself to try and to try and have a sense yes. of feeling like you have a coherent story which the is whole. the irony which is the irony because like self-deception avoiding self-deception is kind of how this all begins right we don't want to be deceived by the senses which are misleading us you know this this phenomenological world isn't the really real world there's like there's there's a you know, there's a, there's a world, you know, there's a physical world beneath this, this layer of corporeal bodies to just borrow Wolfgang Smith's terminology for a second. Cause I think that's a, that's a pretty good distinction. So yeah, I mean, but in reality, it ends up becoming a, a deception because you can't get past, you're still living in the world through your senses of the world and nothing about this um, kind of abstract version is of reality that we've constructed is ever going to be as meaningful or resonant to you as, you know, the world you actually inhabit in your body. Yeah. And speaking of Wolfgang, I, I would, I, you know, I had the thought when I was reading this chapter that it would I would love to see a conversation between him and, and Dave Bentley Hart. I think that would be really interesting because they're both exceptionally intelligent. They'd bet some head, but, they would butt heads over some things. I'm sure I would, I would they, think because they would use Wolfgang, different jargon. Yeah, Wolfgang Smith is a he's a Catholic traditionalist. So meaning and I don't mean like I don't I'm not I don't well, I don't know how much of a trad trad he is. I don't, so I don't mean that in the sense of a trad Catholic. I mean, he's associated with the, tr- the traditional school. So, which would be like the kind of, uh, so he's a Christian perennialist effectively. Mm-hmm. And he actually started his, he's actually started his uh, investigation in religion with Eastern religions. Um, um, so he started studying in India actually studying Eastern religions before he ended up becoming Catholic, but he still is like very much like operating within the traditionalist school. So but I, I mean, assuming so they, people uh, like, they could like avoid Gion political topics, shoe on and people like that. Don't you think they would have quite a bit? I mean, I, I, I do think, you know, in terms of ontology and metaphysics, they would have different words for the same thing, but it would be interesting to there's see. There's actually, they would have a lot of similarities, but there's like, but the problem, traditionalism has a, con, has a tendency toward political conservatism that Hart would not. <laughs> yeah, I actually don't have any idea what Wolfgang Smith's politics are. It's a yeah. tendency toward, it's like, I certainly yeah. have traditionalist reading, re- leanings metaphysically, but 
I, my politics are not conservative. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah. All right, let's move on from that. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a progressive either. Don't worry, people. All right, here we go. Five, under the, under the regime of representation, the intelligible is a veil drawn before the abyss of the unintelligible. And the unintelligible is more real than the intelligible. But what would it really mean to say that something exists that is of its nature alien to, an intel- to intelligibility? Can being and knowing be wholly severed from one another without creating an intolerable contradiction? Could anything truly exist in such a fashion that it could never be perceived of or thought of even if only in principle? How would such a reality be distinct from absolute nothingness? It certainly seems reasonable to assume that being must also be, must also be manifestation, that real subsistence must also be real disclosure, that to exist is to be perceptible, conceivable, knowable, and that to exist fully is to be manifest to consciousness, so long as any absolute qualitative disproportion remains between being and knowing, then being cannot become manifest, and so is not. Being must be intelligible, or even intelligibility itself. The perfectly unintelligible is a logical and ontological contradiction. And this is obviously building on that that argument earlier that mind and and being are of one source. Yeah. Right. Um, that's yeah. I think I don't have much to say about that one. I think that's just kind of that's just kind of building on what what's been said up to this point. Um, okay, play play devil's advocate for a minute. Let's play devil's advocate for a minute here. Um. Can you even? Well, I, I would say I would say a lot of Christians would would have this this tendency to put God at some some remove that is so high above us that it is it is unintelligible. Yeah, okay, this is good. That's a good direction to go with this. I would say for me, this is why I don't like. Notice that David always favors the being becoming this this distinction just as i do Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think the reason he does is is this is why because um when you use the beyond being language you're suggesting a degree of absolute unknowability that has a certain degree of truth to it yeah um as, as apathetic theology would indicate, but it's still is also more fundamentally false because you, you're creating a greater gulf between creator and creature than is actually warranted. Right. Like it, it, it's, it's fine to say that it's, it's kind of out of my grasp now, but to say that, that even in principle, it is unknowable. And which is, which is what I think certain people do. And again, it's, 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 I see it as a move to sort of put this sort of firewall between God and creation so that he, God always remains sort of unsullied and ungraspable and and like out of the reach of our dirty hands. Right. Well, there, a a God that, a God that was truly, that was truly on and ultimately unknowable would be a God who had no desire to be known. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but the, but the, the God of our tradition is a God that has a desire to be known not only to be known but to be one with us right correct which is which is the fullness of knowing right which is why kind of like was it karen Karen said something and i don't remember the context karen said something on twitter a while back about about marriage being the key to everything and i was Mm -hmm. like yes exclamation point because that's like marriage is the ultimate symbol of how you can understand unity and multiplicity. And that's why the Bible uses so much marriage imagery to, to try to communicate the nature of the relation between human and the divine that God seeks. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I think so, it, it it is fundamental, and and it it gets overlooked quite frequently. Um, many many of the times where where Paul's talking about quote unquote mystery, it's it's explicitly referencing that the mystery of the two becoming one. Right, and also again that kind of like like. I don't think God knows anything in that. I think that like that kind of like knowledge as, uh, you know, episteme, I don't think that's like, I don't think God's knowing is anything like that. I think God's knowing is always the knowledge of. And I think that even applies to us because of the incarnation. Yeah. So and, God and has knowledge sense... of us because he, he has the experience he has the same he shares the same experience yeah well exactly and to, sk to skip ahead in some sense his he, even his experiences of us and are in some sense firsthand because in some sense our spirit is his spirit right so the, genesis 2 7 like that's where yeah which david is absolutely right to point to and, and i back it's it's funny this is actually the first place i i'm sure i may have read i've read a lot of david <laughs> stuff so i may have seen him reference it somewhere else this is the first time i explicitly remember it but it's certainly something i've been saying like since we launched this this grail country venture that's like a thing that i keep returning to again and again and again but to me it's like i don't think it's so clear that i don't see how you can deny that like there is a part of us the direct source of which is god yeah. Well, I, I can understand how you can have a system that brackets that out. And, and I think most uh, modern Americans in the West in general has, because of its fascination and its elevation of systems, definitely has that problem. But I think phenomenologically, any sort of examination of, of your own consciousness deeply or, or just even the meaning of your own life and personal existence, you start quickly getting into some areas or just observing, um, even just observing a really good conversation for me, like just observing mm -hmm. really good conversations on the internet in this little corner of the internet was a, was a sort of turning point for me in realizing the God's presence in the midst of, of, of those interactions. Oh, for that, sure. Yeah. And definitely in ones that I've participated in, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, yeah, for sure. Um, it's, we know what, we know what that, we know, we really know what that, uh, what that feels like. And I don't really have any other better way of putting it. it and it's specifically related to attention. And, and, um, and consciousness, which I think are the um, kind of like the, some sort of base component of what, what love is, is really all about. Right. And it's not really, and it's more than just a, it's more than just an emotional reaction too. There's like, there's, it's, it's, it's at a different level than that. I, I'm, I'm, I think like actually, okay. So C.S. Lewis, I think, still has one of the better descriptions of the kind of thing that we're talking about, I think, in Surprised by Joy, when he mm -hmm. talks about, like, his, his experience in reading, like, Norse mythology, and he had, and, and he does, and he, and he describes the experiences as, like, the simultaneous experience of joy and longing. Mm. Yeah, like, Zane's that's, a, Zane's that's a... what that is. And that's like, it's not really, it's not just a, it's not just an emotional thing because there's actually a movement of the intellect that is involved in it. It's more like, which is why I, this, this is why it's more like a, an intellectual intuition than it is a feeling. Of course, intuition is also, you know, the spiritual sense of touch. So in, in a way it is a feeling, it's a spiritual feeling. Yeah, well, it's uh, the, the language I keep coming back to and trying to unravel that is you're right, there's an intellectual component to it, but it's also it's a um, 
I always think of this for some reason, this the image that always comes to my mind is this sense of like, there is a sense of one's own apprehension, like from an intellectual perspective in terms of knowledge is being passed to you that you didn't have previously that, that you clearly don't have, um, some sort of easy rational means of disco of, of explaining how it came into your possession. Right. But also there's a sense in that it, while, you, well, there is a voluntary component of it in, in this, in another sense, it's not you apprehending something. It's you being apprehended. It's mm-hmm. like you, you're kind of caught up into it and, and you kind of choose to go along with it. Or you can also choose to be like, no, not doing it. Um, and um, it is, yeah, there, there's something very deep and mysterious there that I think, um, uh, I think there's a lot, there's a lot that can be brokered there in terms of um, anybody who's interested in, in figuring out um, kind of the source of all being, you know, in, in those, those kind of moments, like um, taking this, them seriously and, and not, and just, just for a moment pretending that maybe this quote unquote spirituality stuff is real and that it's not just a, a chemical soup in my brain that is right. Making maybe certain, I've actually like, connected to something. Yeah. And just, just pretend for a minute, like, like you were saying, like pretend that the, the fairy is real and that you're having a conversation with it and see what, I mean, what, what transpires when you do that and, um, and, and see if you can come up with a rational explanation for how, um, you know, uh, random firings in your brain could create that you know um yeah i don't know i I, i've I've thought long and hard about how that's good that's um, that's good i think like i don't know if we can tack i don't know if we have enough time left to really tackle another one so i think that would be a good place to stop and just like by encouraging people um please please talk to the fairies (laughs) they're feeling neglected they're much more real than electrons. <laughs> so good. thanks, thanks, thanks for joining me for another one of these chats, Michael. Um, yeah.